Hello everyone. Welcome to class. I've got a special guest lecturer today. This is Luna. She was crying to get into this room, so she's going to spend part of the lecture with us. I hope you don't mind. How's the, uh, how's the volume? I got a new microphone, so the sound quality should actually be better today, if anything. Ugh. Here we go. All right, this is going to be the best lecture yet. So most of you voted for some sort of pet interaction. So here you go. I'm, I'm fulfilling the request from the survey for people to, uh, to have my pets in the stream. All right. But she's pretty sleepy. So how's everyone doing today? Everyone started the assignment so far? All right, let's have a look at this. So the order of the lectures has changed just a little bit. If we look here um, in the description of the lectures that I had for the schedule, what happened so far um, is that we had the intro, we had agents and environments, and then in order to give you as much time as possible for the assignment, what I did was I actually released um, I combined the search strategies and the problem solving lecture into one actual stream. And so what we can do here now is we can kind of say, um, let's do, let, let's put it like this. Problems, search, um, plus A1. Uh, maybe I can fit problem solving in there. There we go. So now this is going to be um, A1 help and uh, tutorial stream. Okay, so what this stream is gonna be, I've had a number of questions about the assignment so far. And since we covered the lecture that I wanted to cover today, then I'm not going to be going through slides today. Today is just gonna be like interacting with people in the class. Um, what you can do actually is if you have any questions about the assignment, you can uh, PM me on Discord or you can send me an email to my Gmail and I'll go over the answer to those questions. Of course, I'll keep your, um, your identity anonymous and we'll go over the answer to those questions on the stream. And so I've got a list of questions already. I've got this, uh, this big text file here with like eight or nine or 10 questions that I've gotten. And so I'll go over that as well. So if you're having any problems with the assignment or if you want to uh, see these answers when it comes to assignment two, then you can always come back to this, this video um, for that sort of help. So, um, any questions you have, you can PM me on Discord or you can type in the chat and I'll be happy to answer them during this class. But let's first go over the things that, uh, that I missed in the first very, very long lecture about assignment one. And again, these things will carry forward throughout the term. And so um, we're not gonna need to explain as much about the implementation of assignment two because of course you will have done assignment one already. And assignment two is basically new algorithms and optimizations, not a new uh, architecture. So that won't be too difficult for you to figure out. Okay, so let's go over this, uh, this text file of questions that I had. So first I'll cover the things that I talked about on D2L. So if we go over to the, uh, the D2L homepage, that will be this, um, this post that I made just in case you missed that. So if we are here over in the assignment and let me make this font a little bit bigger, that should be more readable. I do not need the update right now. So if we go over to search student, the, the part where you are implementing everything, then there was talk of this path variable, right? So the this dot path variable, the way that this works, and today actually I can I can go into a bit more of a, of how the the user interface actually works. So I'll, if we have time, I'll just go through the grid GUI and explain how that works. So this is the path if the search found one. So what that means is if you found a path in your search. So first of all, whenever a search starts from a new start location to a new goal location, you have to update this 
um, you have to reset this path variable, right? Because any path variable that was set from before is going to be persistent. And so whenever we start a new search, we want to reset that path variable back to blank. And down here in our search, uh, search iteration, once we've found um, the path in here, what we do is we set, uh, we, would, we would figure out the this.path equals, and then we set that into equal to some path. So what does that path actually consist of? So I said all that stuff before, but the thing I didn't say is what does the actual path consist of, right? And so what the actual path consists of um, is the following. So the path that you construct should be an array of actions. So for example, if the path consisted of moving right, and again, an action is a two element array with the X and the Y change. So if you have to move right three times, which would be one zero three times, and then you move up two times. So again, moving up is decreasing in the Y and moving down is increasing in the Y. So moving up would be uh, an action of zero, negative one. So zero in the X, negative one in the Y two times. Then the path would be, um, so you have it all in an array, right? So a JavaScript array um, or a JavaScript list, however you want to call that. Um, and then inside that array, the elements would be one zero, one zero, one zero. 0, negative 1, 0, negative 1. And so essentially the path is an ordered list of actions, right? And why does the order matter, you might say? Well, for example, if I um, took this element and put it here, we would still end up in the same place, right? So if you sum all of the actions, no matter what order they're in, you'll still get the same thing in the end. But the issue is, Yes, you'll still land at the same place, but if you go through, right? For example, if I have a path um, that's an L shape, so say for example, uh, well, let's just take this, this path. Oh, sorry, that's, the, uh, that's not the solution. Say for example, this path, right? Which goes around in a C shape. Well, if I had taken the actions of going right first, then obviously that path, even though the sum would have landed me on the same tile, it would have been trying to go through here, right? So that's, you have to have them in the correct order in order for the path to be drawn correctly. Because what the GUI actually does, and I'll show this in a second, is it starts from the starting location, adds the action, and then draws this in white. Then it adds the next action and draws this in white. And then it adds the next action and draws that in white. So here, if I go back over to the text file, it says, you then set the this.path variable equal to that path if a path is found, all right? So if you find a path, you then construct the path somehow, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and, and then you set the this.path variable equal to that path. So has anyone out there gotten a working, uh, a working solution yet for breadth first search? Still working on it? Nice, so some people have a bit of a working solution. How are your times in comparison to the solution time? We'll talk about that in a bit. We'll talk about optimizations and speed, but uh, I'll, I'll go through with this now. So, number two here, was how do we actually construct the path, okay? And so the construction of the path, well, let's bring up the blackboard here. So uh, I've got to bring up my, uh, my blackboard. Uh-oh, behind the scenes. All right, we're going to the blackboard. Now I actually need one second to bring up the blackboard scene. Forgot to have this prepared, but we'll do it live. That's why I practice, right? All right, so let me... Uh... There we go. Got to get the color and the size right. Okay, so let me just test. There we go, we got the Blackboard scene back. All right, so all of these nodes in the open list, right? They are actually nodes on the search tree, okay? So these nodes, this is the root node, so this is the start, right? 
And what we do is, for each node, we generate some children. We expand this node. And then we go to the next node, which has a new state. And then we expand those nodes, right? And we go to a new node that has a new state. And then we do this one, right? And then we do this one. But I, I'm i going to draw depth first search, but I actually mean breadth first search because it's, it's a bit nicer. So a bit nicer to visualize. So then we go down like this. And then we might go down like this, right? So this is how our search tree looks. We've got nodes. And each of those nodes have a parent, right? So in the node, there's a parent. Um, so node.parent, that's what the, uh, the orange means. And so in each node, we store like a pointer or a variable which points back to the parent. So down here, for example, we have uh, this is this one's parent. It's also this one's parent. It's also this one's parent, right? So what happens is, in order to find a path, let's say down here, we have found a, uh, a node. And the state of this node, when we pop it off of the open list, this is the goal. Okay, so how do we find the goal? This wasn't necessarily explained last time. So we find the goal by going back through the pointers to the parents, okay? So what we can do is we can have a node, that's our goal, and then we take the action. So this node also has an action, right? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna have a path, p equals, and then we're going to add this action into the path, okay? Then we follow the node pointer back to this one. And then we take its action and add that into the path. Then we follow the pointer back to this one. We take its action and add it into the path. Then we take this pointer and we add its action into the path. Then we take this one, right? So what we do is we keep going back and back and back until we reach a node whose parent is null, okay? So it's actually null in JavaScript because we set the, the parent of the root node is null because in the tree, the parent has no, or sorry, the root node has no parent. And so by setting that equal to null, um, we know when to stop going back here. So now we have the path, but can anyone tell me why, what, what do we need to do to this in order for it to be the actual path? Did any run in, anyone run into uh, to this, to this issue yet? All right, so there was a hint, right? In the, uh, let me go back to this for a second. So you can construct the path by going backward from the goal node through the parent variables Uh, excuse me, until you reach a node with the null parent, which will be the starting state. You can add all of these nodes actions to an array and then reverse it to get the final path. And so the reason we reverse it, if I bring this back up, is because the first action that we add is the last action, right? The second action that we add is the second last action. And so we have to take this array and then we have to reverse it, okay? So we, whatever method you do, I think there's like arrays.reverse or something in Java really easy, or you could just make a secondary data structure and reverse it, or you could reverse it in place by um, one really cool reversal algorithm is if you just go through and you take the first one and swap it with the last and then the second one and swap it with the second last all the way down to the middle one. So you can do a number of different things um, in order to reverse that, but that's how you actually construct the path. I'm not going to write the code for that because I don't want to give you the full solution. So let's go to the programming again. Uh, all right. So part three, you should always run your program with the Chrome JavaScript debug window open so that you can see any errors which may be happening. You can open the JavaScript window with control shift J. Okay. So I saw a number of people were telling me things like, oh, the the GUI crashes or, you know, something random is happening. 
and I don't know my, why my program isn't working. Well, one thing you can do is you can open up the JavaScript console over here. So you can see that, now I know this is a little bit, uh, a little bit small on the screen. I, I don't know if I can actually increase this font size, can I? Oh, I can, look at that, perfect. So what it's printing out right now is the construction time for the search, okay? So if you noticed, when I choose um, student BFS, the, construct the search construction time listed in milliseconds is very, very small because not much is happening in, in your actual constructor, right? Because the constructor for your class is, is done for you. This is the constructor. All it does is, is put some variables in there. And so if we go back here, if I then select solution BFS, oh, look at this. Now there's 76 milliseconds, okay? So the, the constructor for my solution has a bunch of stuff going on in it. And it's those things that are going on. So if I keep rerunning that path, right? And for some reason in Chrome, if you keep rerunning the same JavaScript function, it gets faster and faster to a point, right? So here, for example, that took four milliseconds, but if I keep rerunning it, that it took two milliseconds. So I don't know if it does some weird caching or memoization or something like that. But anyway, um, it's not memoizing it, but it's, it's, it does run faster the second time you click it. So again, if I run tests, then I'll run tests a couple of times and you can see that um, it took 14 milliseconds for, um, for the solution code to run. So the reason for that has to do with the, the construction time um, of the search algorithm. And so what we're going to see in assignment two is that uh, there's a bunch of stuff we do that we pre-compute in order to make this run this fast, okay? So don't go ask people in previous courses. Let's, you know, let's discover that together. You can put whatever optimizations, once you get assignment one to work, you can put whatever optimizations in there that you want, okay? So I highly encourage people to go um, seek out optimizations as long as it's not, you know, from previous class notes or, or previous assignments. Um, so, so that's why my solution is running so fast. And if yours is not running that fast, that's fine. Okay, we'll talk about everything that I did um, during the assignment two lecture. So I just had another question. And the question is, when is it due? Okay, so if you go to the spreadsheet for the course, uh, that I put on D2L, this is the thing that you should bookmark because pretty much everything you need to know for the course is posted here, okay? So wherever you see blue here, um, that's when an assignment is going to be released and it's also going to be when the previous assignment is due. So over here, um, if you look, the 29th, so a week from today is when assignment one is due, right? So you had 12 days to do this, okay. Uh, now, let's go to the next thing. Someone else said, if the GUI crashes, you most likely have either have an infinite loop or ON squared or something more. Um, so the Google Doc is just for uh, students of the course. And so if you're not officially registered in the course, um, because of university regulations and stuff, I'm, I'm not giving out all the files to people who aren't in the course. Um, so that spreadsheet is going to be just for students and please students don't share the spreadsheet. It's not the end of the world if it gets out. I just don't want that to be like super, um, super distributed because what happens is if all, if all the code gets out, then, you know, assignments get posted and stuff like that. And that's, that's not what I want or assignment solutions get posted. Okay. So, um, something else, uh, someone said, where should I add the path code? Okay, that's a good question. So down here, at some point in your search iteration code, right, because all this is going to be gone. So at some point, what you're going to have is you're going to like be, so you say, let node equal remove from open list, right? So you remove something from the open list, depending on whether it's BFS or DFS or whatever. And then you're going to say, if node.state equal goal node, right? And then this is when you know I have found a solution. And so right here is where you construct the path, okay? So you'd say let um, 
found path equal something, and then you construct found path, and then you can say this dot path equals found path, or something like that. Okay. So right here is where you do the thing that I was talking about before, where you follow the pointers of the parents back until you find a node with no parents. All right. So that's how that's how you um, that's how you construct the path there. Oh, that's hilarious! I've had the uh, the RTX voice on this whole time. So I'm. Give me one second here. All right, All right, so this, so this shouldn't, shouldn't sound, sound this shouldn't sound too much different. <clears throat> Excuse me, uh, but there, you will hear a little bit of mouse clicking and stuff now. Okay, doc is posted for forty three hundred, but not thirty two hundred. Interesting. Did I really not post that? Well, here we go. I apologize. I did not mean to do that. Okay, so we're going to share this. We're going to get a link. And now I'm going to post that. So you can see me, uh, you can see me doing this live. So here's the proof. New announcements item. 3200 slash, oh, I think I may have posted it for 6980. So class spreadsheet. And then the courses got combined. Um, here is a link to the class spreadsheet. Okie doke. So there is the link to that. So that should be there now for people to look at. So apologize for that. Um, this is also where I post links to the lectures. And so if, uh, yeah, I, I screwed up. Um, I didn't post that. All right. So on to, on to the next question. Oh, one other thing I wanted to show about the, the Chrome debugger, which is really cool, is that um, let's say we're in here. So I'm going to go down to the GUI. And I'm going to add some code here that lets me print out something when I press a button. Actually, I won't do that. I'll go to the search student. And what I'll do is I'll create a new variable in the constructor. So this dot temp array equals. And now let me do like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So I've created a temporary array. And now I want to say console dot log temp array. So in JavaScript, I can actually console dot log out like a big data structure like this. I can even say, so let's also say console dot log this. Okay. So that's the pointer to the, this object, which is the search student object. Now, if I go back and I refresh temp array is not, oh, sorry. So I'm going to console.log this.temporary. All right. So what you see over here now are two things. If I print out an array, it actually gives me this like cool drop down menu of all the things that are in the array. And so over here, what you see printing out is the actual data structure of the array. Also, what I did is I can print out this, which is the entire object. Okay. The entire search student object. And now I have a drop down which is all of the variables inside that object. And so, for example, if I want to see what's in the closed list, I can just click here. If I want to see what's in the config at this particular time. Um, so this debugger is like super, super nice. And what you can do is just like keep track of the this object. Um, so you don't need to like print everything out. If you ever want to see what's in your open list or your closed list, then um, this is what you can do, right? So my open list, here's my temp array that I set up. And down here you have proto object. That's all the stuff that Java, that, these are the, the functions that are on, um, that are inside this class. And then if you go into proto object, then you have all the functions that each class has by default in JavaScript, okay? So you can dig right down like this. So that's a really neat feature of the debugger. And I highly recommend that, that people do that, okay? 
So I actually switched inputs. Is the uh, the sound quality still all right? I think it should be. Man, I've got a, like a crazy delay on the... Okay, perfect. Okay, so let's go to the next one. So that's that's the Chrome debugging, and it's going to be your friend throughout the throughout the term. And uh, Firefox also has a debugger. I prefer Firefox as a browser, just for privacy reasons. But Chrome really does have a nice debugger. Uh, someone in the chat asks, uh, I think I missed it, but what goes in the closed versus open list slash would I find that info in the last lecture? Um, yes. So the it's kind of the next point. So let's talk about that. So there's an open list and there's a closed list when you do your search, right? So for example, um, if I go over here to a bigger, um, bigger visualization and I drag, I have some nodes that are in the open list and some nodes that are in the closed list, all right? So the open list are the yellow nodes and the red list is the closed states, okay? So when I say that this, the, the nodes here are yellow, um, that's a bit, a little bit disingenuous, okay? Because what we're viewing here are not nodes, they're states, right? So if we remember that, these are states. And if I go down here to single step and then rerun, um, so I go single step, right? So I've, I've expanded just the root node, and then I create these four nodes, and I put them in the open list. Now I do another step where I expand one node. So every step when you click single step is one expansion. So we expand another node, another node, and you can see how this is happening in a breadth first manner or a four directional breadth first manner at least. So the way that the GUI visualizes this is that it needs to have access to the states of the closed list. And the good thing is the closed list already stores states. And it also needs to have access to the states that are in the search tree in the open list. All right. So how does it do that? Well, the open list actually stores nodes. It doesn't store states. And so we have this little function in here. There's two functions that are specific to the user interface. Okay. Um, this one here returns an array of the states that are in the open list. And this one returns an array of states that are in the closed list. And so if you didn't, if you just store a, an array of states in the closed list, then you can just return this.closed. Okay, so that will work for the closed list if you didn't, if all you do is store an array of states there, which is fine. But up here, you cannot do this, this dot, or, or return this dot open. And the reason you can't just return this dot open is because those are nodes, right? And the GUI is expecting states. And so what you have to do in here is you have to somehow construct and return an array of the states. And I showed how to do that in the last lecture. So you can refer to the assignment one lecture where I explained how to do that. So here it says, um, the open list should store node objects and the closed list should store states. So this is like states are, are, are um, arrays of size two with an X and a Y location. If your closed list is storing nodes, points will be deducted because your closed list should not store nodes, A, and if you return nodes, it won't be able to draw them. Is, a, is there a wrapper function in JS like in Python? I'm not sure what that function does, so uh, I don't know. Okay. The next question that I had um, via email and Discord was about this section of the marking scheme. Okay. So all of the all of the marking scheme scheme stuff was pretty self-evident except this one. So for example, when it says code has consistent indenting, it means that you've followed the the scheme that I've put here, right? So here we have the function which is indented. Everything inside this function is going to be indented. Everything inside an if statement, unless it's a single line if statement is going to be indented as well, right? So you can do things like this, but make sure, like 
you'll see people, and this is fine, right? You'll see people do this. And this is, in my opinion, not fine. You should always enclose things in, in brackets when... Even if it's a single, a, a single statement like return, you should still enclose it properly, right? And the reason for that is, let's say that you had it like this. And you wanted to do something like, oh, I want to do something before I return, right? And so you say, okay, let uh, x equals do something cool, right? And now you're like, done. Well, can anyone tell me why this is going to fail? Right? So what actually happens here? Well, if this is true, it will do this. Oh, it's not just missing a semicolon, right? If it'll do this, and then it will always return. Because indentation means nothing, right? Sy syntactically, or semantically. So this is what the function's actually doing, right? So if you're like, why is he wrapping it like that? Well, it's because it's it's safer and a little bit more readable. Okay, so that's why that's why I wrap things like this. Um, okay, so can this consistent indenting just follow what's here so far, right? If you want to see, like for example, the constructor, this is very very neat, um, and you don't do anything like super crazy or within your own code, you want to follow. Um, you want to follow. Uh, the style that, that I've put there. Um, functions used where appropriate. So for example, if you want to put in a new function, um, oh, so function used where appropriate means, for example, that you're using the is legal action function. You are using the grid.get function. You are using the grid or grid.is out of bounds function. Oh, I also had another question, which was why is this a bug? Okay, so get x, y returns y, x. And the thing is, no, it is not a bug. It is that the visualization is the transpose of how the actual matrix is stored. And the reason for that is because of how the uh, index.html, how this is stored. So this happened to be put into here. The way this is parsed, you end up with a 2D array, which is actually the transpose. So that's not a bug. Um, I just put that in there for you. So when I say functions used were appropriate, it means that you're using the functions, right? Because you don't want to have all this logic down here in your search iteration function. You want to use a function. So one of the, the things that I want to sort of beat into your heads throughout the course of, of this course is that wherever you are trying to do logic, like a search iteration logic, you want excuse me, you want that function to read as much like English as possible, right? So for example, you could take this right here where you construct the path and you could have, um, you could have a function where you say, for example, um, okay, so you could say construct path and you take in a node. And what this function will do, it, was, it will re uh, compute and return the path from the root node to the given node, okay? So you don't have to do that for this assignment. I'm not gonna be so um, picky with that, but this will come into, come into play much more on the second assignment where we have a lot more functions. Assignment comments removed. What this means is that, for example, um, like student to do, implement this, like you can just remove these, right? So these are here for you and they just make it like more code for us to scroll, scroll through and mark. So you can remove those. Um, and student comments uh, where explanation is necessary. So for example, people are like, well, how much is, is too much, right? Well, for example, this is a good comment, right? So the cost of the path for this assignment is the path length times 100, since all action costs are equal to 100. Because this line of code on its own doesn't really explain itself. It it multiplies something by like a um, by a magic number, right? And whenever we do that, and we want to do that as little as possible, and we won't be doing this for assignment two, uh, you want to explain that. 
And down here, these comments, is this a comment that we should have there? Well, it's, it's not terrible, it's not great, right? So at some point we've found a path, so we set in progress to false. So this is a case where I am explaining things a little bit more than you would have to explain it to me. Okay, so that is those. And when I say like, if your code is not indented properly, like, it's like 2% off. It's not going to be a big thing. Like, all of these things together are 10 out of 10, right? Um, and it's just because computer science, well, not computer science, but software engineering, and if you go to a company, right, where you have to do, you, you have to program within someone else's framework, you have to adhere to their style as well, right? And I'm, I'm trying to instill some of those values um, at this level. Because you, if, if it's a third year course, you probably haven't had to worry about anything like that so far. Any preference to inline comment versus separate line? Um, separate line is fine. If you have something where, like for example, up here, this is where I use um, same line comments because it just saves a ton of white space, right? So where it makes sense, um, where it makes sense, do that. All right, so I had a question about the optimizations in my solution. So for example, if we go back to the default, if you click here and then you click here with the solution, nothing happens, like literally nothing, okay? My search doesn't even start. And so your search will probably, st oh, oops. Um, yeah, so when I click here and click here, so I click here, then click here. In like, there is nothing in my closed list. It took no time. So we have some optimizations that, so my, my solution code to assignment one is using the solution code to assignment two with, a, with more optimizations on top of that. And one of them, which we will learn for assignment two, is we can pre-compute whether or not paths exist between two points, okay? So the, the, the problem of does a path exist is a much simpler problem than compute the shortest path. And so in the pre-computation step of my optimizations, I actually pre-compute wherever like there, there's no path between these points. And so that's why there's no closed list being printed versus in yours, I would probably expect there to be like all red like this, okay? Um, some people are saying, how does your search not start? How do you know? Well, that's something for you to think about. Um, and when we do the assignment two lecture, so when are we doing that? Okay, so the assignment two lecture on the 29th. So the day that this is due, you will be learning about these optimizations. Okay, that, that's all I can say. I'm not going to spoil it because I don't want to get too far ahead of myself. Um... Another question I had was about the depth first search behavior. So I had a number of comments about my depth first search doesn't look like your depth first search, right? So for example, if we do the animated search for depth first search, this is what mine looks like. Yours is going to look different than this. So the reason for that is, is based on a number of things. Mostly it's based on the order in which you chose the actions. Right, so depth first search, um, if you remember, if we go back to the blackboard here. So depth first search, the way that it moves depends on um, the order of the action. So for example, if the leftmost action was like move left, right? And we keep going down here in depth first search, then that depth first search will, the paths will always check the left direction first. If instead the leftmost action was move up, then you'll see the search going up first. So if we rerun this path, you can see that my search, the leftmost action is the one being done first. And the reason for that is because the this or conf, this dot config dot actions. So here's another thing that you can do. Um, down here, the is legal action function, or sorry, in the search function, the four legal actions are up, down, left, and right. So you don't need to, for example, 
Uh, down here, you shouldn't be saying let legal actions equal and then typing it all out, right? What, so one thing that I constantly see in assignment one is the following. I see um, the case. So for example, the code which is going to generate the children, what I see is the following. I see uh, case for moving left, right? And then someone will say, okay, let action equals, so moving left is negative one, zero. Oh, sorry, thank you. Programming. So what I see very often um, in, in the first assignment, not in the second assignment, but I see it in the first assignment, is people will have case for moving right, let action equal um, one, zero, and then case for moving up, Right, and so so what's happening here is that there are four essentially duplicated code blocks that do the exact same thing, with the only difference being what the action variable is. So this is uh, not what you should do, and all you have to do is say um, iterate. So I'm not going to type the code for you, but this dot config dot actions is an array of all the legal actions, right? So you can say down here, um, for let a equals zero, a less than this dot config dot actions dot length, a plus plus, and now let action equal this dot config dot actions a. All right, and then you can put all your code here and you don't need to duplicate it. So whenever you're doing the same logic, but with different data, then you should have a loop that grabs the data and does the logic in one place, okay? So if you do end up like having four separate, if you have four copy and pasted blocks of code, then I'm not gonna take off marks for that in the first assignment. I certainly will for the second assignment. Oh my God, yes. And, and there's a good reason for that. But we're grabbing the data of what actions are legal via this, this thing here, okay? And the GUI sets the this.config.actions. So I have, a, uh, I have a question in the chat. Should we attempt to do optimizations like your code if we have time? Try and get as close as your solution as possible. Yes, I, I highly recommend you do that uh, if you have, excuse me, if you have time. So like I said before, what you want to do is you want to get your assignment working so that you get the most marks possible, right? And if we look at the marks, how are you gonna get the most marks possible? Well, you're gonna have clean code where you use the functions properly. You're going to use the proper data structures. So you're gonna have a queue for the BFS, a stack for the, for the DFS. Um, you're going to have your BFS pathfinding working and you're going to have your DFS pathfinding working. So you're gonna get all of those things working to the point where all of your tests path pass, okay? So when you run your tests, you get 20 out of 20, right? And if you run your tests and you get 20 out of 20, then you wanna click random tests, okay? Because random tests, that's, that's how you know that it's working if all of those start working. So. If I see code in anyone's, I had this once, I've taught this course four times now, and one person, <laughs> oh, it's so ridiculous. You know what I'm about to say they did, right? <laughs> if start equals this and goal equals this, they, they set the variables equal to that. Like, in what universe, do you think I'm not going to check that? Like, it's just crazy. I guess if you have 30 minutes to do the assignment because you left it long enough, then you try and sneak some marks out of me, right? And no, if you do nothing, one student tried to argue that, um, that because you got like seven or something on the, on the initial one that you should get seven out of 20 for the mark. No, that's, you didn't do anything. Okay. So in terms of optimizations, get everything working first and then try and make it fast, okay? And I will show 
the fastest three solutions in um, in class during a lecture. And read the names proudly. And you'll also get a little award sticker on D2L. So D2L actually has awards. I'm the only person I know that actually knows that. And so there'll be a little certificate. So like assignment one champion or something like that. Um, I'm not going to give any tips for optimizing because the tips for optimizing, I want assignment one to be, what could you figure out? Okay. Um, and assignment two, I'm literally going to tell you every single optimization. So your assignment two code should be just about as fast as my assignment two code. Uh, oh yeah. So the whole point of that, when it comes to the, the DFS, okay, your tests will not pass because the tests aren't supposed to pass. The BFS is optimal. The DFS is not optimal. So there is, there is no testing for DFS. The only thing we are testing for with DFS is does your path make it from the start to the goal, okay? So the TA will um, will drag it around and if, you're, if it moves from the start to the goal, then you're good, okay? And it doesn't have to look at all like mine looks. It doesn't have to create the same path that mine does. It just has to go from the start to the goal in some manner, okay? So that's what DFS is. And literally, if you coded it up correctly, your BFS solution and your DFS solution should differ in one line of code. Uh, I got another question. Do we need to eventually code GUI for later assignments? No, you will never have to touch the GUI code. But because some people have asked about how it works, I will be going over the GUI code um, if we have time today. And it looks like we will have time. I haven't gotten any questions on, on D2L, by the way. So uh, feel free to, to ask me questions if you don't want to type them in chat. Or uh, sorry, not D2L, but uh, Discord. All right. The last question that I got was, whenever you see a size variable in the assignment one code, just put in a one. And so I think that the only case where this happens that I forgot to remove was in the grid object, okay? So over here in grid, some people, uh, their is out of bounds function was not working properly because they didn't pass in a size. And I'll show you what the size means in a bit, but uh, actually let me just show you right now. So the size variable, if I go to, um, let me just pull this up in Chrome, actually. That'll be much better. So my website. Do, 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 do. I just want to make sure that I'm not giving away a solution code here on my website. All right. Okay, so I have a website, which is my website slash search which is like a whole bunch of different algorithms and cool stuff that you can play around with. Um, so this is here. And so for assignment one, what we have is we have paths like this, right? We're now in, in on this, we're actually doing uh, eight directional search. Actually, I wanna, here's the thing that I don't like about Firefox is that JavaScript is so slow in Firefox. It's just way faster in Chrome. So if I paste that in here, it's just way faster. So that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna run this in Chrome. Um, this is way, way faster. So over here, there's now an object size. And the cool thing about the object size is that in the second assignment, we'll be doing different object sizes. And this will change the like legality of some paths. Like for example, um, if I go from here to here, this path can make it through this like one sized little, little maze here. But if I change this to two by two, now the object uh, can't fit through this maze and so it has to go around. And if I change it to three by three, then the path is no longer possible, okay? Because it can't fit a three by three up here. And so when you see a size variable, it's actually relating to assignment two because they use the same architecture. So that's why um, that is happening. So whenever you call um, this dot grid dot is out of bounds, you have to you have to pass in one. Now, there's one other little tip. Um, 
that's when you when you are calling. So the reason why you might be calling this dot grid dot get out of bounds is because when you when you generate new locations, right? Let's say our our um, our agent is right here, like the node is at this state right on the edge of the map. Then you'll probably generate an action going to the right, right? Because going right is an action. So you need to test if that's legal. So what you need to do is you first need to check. You always check first whether or not it's out of bounds. Because if you try and check the color, right? If you try and this dot get x, y, and it's out of bounds, you'll crash. Your program will crash because it's out of bounds of the array. So what you first need to check is if it's out of bounds and then check this dot get. Okay, so that was the last thing here. Um, whenever you see a size variable in the assignment one code, just put in a one. Okay, so if there's any other questions at all about assignment one, please let me know because I'm gonna use, I don't have lecture material uh, for this, for the rest of this, um, for the like 25 minutes that we have left. So I'm going to go over a bit of the GUI and how that works. But I don't see any. So let's just go into some of the GUI code. Now, from here on to the rest of the lecture, for anyone who's watching, you do not need to know this. It's just for the people who are curious about how the GUI actually works. Okay. So, um, here, let me remove all the code that I wrote today. Just want to make sure that I'm not like putting a bunch of stuff in. Okay. So when it comes to the user interface, it all starts with the HTML file. And I said this before, but I'll just say it again, that the GUI is in a JavaScript object and that object is called a grid GUI. And so every, every assignment has a different um, GUI object. And that GUI takes in as a constructor um, the container. Excuse me. So there's a div called container. That's down here. Okay. So I set up a div. And if you know HTML, I'm not going to go into HTML. But there's essentially a div that the entire thing lives in. Um, you're going to pass in that div. And then the GUI is going to construct itself within that div. You're also going to pass in the starting map that it should see by default, okay? And that is just document.getElement by ID, which is one of the text areas down here, which has that text inside it. Then what happens is um, we have a function called update. And inside that update function, we're going to call the GUI's draw function, okay? So we construct the GUI up here, and then we're going to keep drawing the GUI's draw function. And then what we do after that is JavaScript has this thing called set interval. And what that does is we pass in the first argument is the name of a function. And the second argument is how often in milliseconds that we should call that function. So what's actually happening is that we set up this grid GUI object. And then this is a thousand milliseconds. So that's one second divided by 60. So every 60th of a second, so 60 frames per second, this GUI.draw function gets called. So let's go over to the GUI. And, and see how that actually works. So, and I'm not gonna be explaining absolutely every little thing, but just how it sort of gets, um, gets how, how it works in relation to the assignment. So here, um, the first thing I call is super container. So you can see here that this grid GUI extends GUI. And this, this uh, GUI class, this is all just helper functions. Oh, excuse me, I tabbed outside. Um, this class is literally all just helper functions, which I have written to let me very quickly create and destroy elements in, in the user interface itself. So for example, I can add select boxes and these have um, some parameters. And then I actually manually go and, and change the select box. So what I'm doing here is I have helper functions, which when I pass in certain variables, they go through and they actually construct the HTML element and insert it into the div in the proper place. Okay, so that's what this function is. Also, this is done with canvas. So I have a background canvas and a foreground canvas. So for example, the map itself is being drawn to a background canvas and then the paths are being drawn to a foreground canvas. So the reason that this is drawing so fast, usually, so for example, if I go up to this uh, StarCraft map, right, 
the reason that this is able to to draw so fast here is because the background um the background like the actual map here is not being updated that is statically drawn to a background object and only the path the open list and the closed list are being redrawn every frame and you can see once i actually um get a longer path where i'm drawing a lot of closed list stuff like this is 256 times 256 that is like hundreds of thousands of nodes right so that has to be drawn every time so i'm actually amazed that canvas is so fast will our solutions be tested on all maps or just the default so your solution will be tested just on the default map but when i go to time your solutions to see who's the fastest i will be using some of the larger maps okay just to time that so for example i'll open up the starcraft map click here and click here so I'll get like this one and then like rerun previous. So this like takes 30 milliseconds with the solution, right? Yours will probably take a little bit longer because we haven't talked about the optimizations yet. So that's how the user interface um, is drawn. Uh, and the actual drawing of that happens in the grid GUI function. So let me just talk about some of the class variables of, of the GUI for now. So um, this dot map equals new grid. So the grid is represented just by this function here, okay? So we have uh, a 2D array, which is just consisting of integers, zeros, ones, or twos for this example. And what happens is, so that is all down here. So if you look, all the maps consists of zeros, ones, and twos right here. And the way that's translated to color is that inside the GUI object, there's a this.colors array. And so if there was a zero, it will pull it from the zeroth element of this array. If there's a one, it will pull it from this array or this element. If it's a two, it'll pull it from this element. So for example, if you want to change the color of, um, of one of the things, so let me just put in two Fs here. So this is red and green, right? So what's red and green? Is that yellow? So if I go back here and I refresh, then all the grass, which was green, is now yellow. So that's how the, the colors are done, right? There's nothing special about grass. There's nothing special about anything like that. It's just that it's pulling the color. So it looks up the value of the grid and it then does this. Uh, got some questions here. Do you have a rust, rough estimate for where our times would be expected to fall? I don't remember. Um, I, as, so here's kind of the rule for the assignment. Actually, this is important and I didn't say it yet, is that your code should take at most like a second or so per path okay if 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 i run tests and it takes more than like 30 seconds then something is wrong okay so it should be less than a second per path for sure it doesn't have to be zero milliseconds but it should definitely be less than a second per path like we have to be able to to run the tests another question did you generate the maps manually seems tedious Okay, so yes, it would be tedious. Um, I generated the maps in different ways. So let me refresh this because that yellow is hurting my eyes. So this map, so when I, I did my PhD at the University of Alberta, um, which is a great school for AI. And in that course, um, there is a course called, what was it? I can't remember the, the course number. But anyway, the course was uh, advanced C++ in game programming. And one of the assignments, well, and we used, H, or we used uh, C++ and OpenGL in that course to do essentially the A star search algorithm. And so as a part of that, one of the, one of the TAs for the co course wrote up a user interface. And my mind was blown because that was the first time that I had ever seen in an assignment and that's why I put so much work into this course assignments is because when, when we had that user interface, it made the assignment so much easier. And this map was literally just taken from that assignment. So I asked him if, um, if, I, like, if he didn't mind me actually taking that map and using it in my course. And he said, no, of course not. And uh, so that was uh, Sterling Orston, I believe. I think he's a software engineer at Google now. But uh, yeah, so I got this map from that and he handcrafted this map. But what he did was he drew it in paint and then outputted the pixels to a text file. Um, sparse caves. 
So these maps, I actually have a generator. So is anyone in this course, did you do uh, 4303? So 4303, probably not because it's a fourth year course. Actually, no, you didn't because this is a prerequisite for that course. So in Computer Science 4303, which is AI for video games, we do some procedural content generation. And we actually literally do the algorithm for, for generating this type of map. And so the sparse caves and the dense caves, these were all generated by my generator that I actually teach in that course. And the denseness of the caves ends up just being a parameter in that procedural content generation. Uh, the mazes, uh, I just ran a maze generator. Um, so there's maze generators all over the place uh, and you can download them and, oh, by the way, if you haven't tried this yet, it's, it's pretty cool. So if you generate this and then you go to animated search and rerun it, and then you set this like to 16 X speed, it's really cool that you can see the breadth first search and how it solves the maze. I really, really like this visualization. Right, so that's how breadth first search solves this maze. And um, let me actually load up that search again. Yeah, okay, so I have that in the right place. So if I go back to the search, this is really cool too. So if I load up the maze, or actually I want the medium maze, so let's do this. So I want, I'm going to use an object now that's the same size as the actual maze walls, right? So let's go from there to here, but let's watch that with, um, let's go breadth first search and we will animate the search, okay? and we'll turn that up to about 8x speed or maybe 4x. So now you can like that is like way more satisfying. But really cool as well is how you can see depth first search working. Right? So now you can see depth first search going out and exploring something and then it will come back to expand the last thing that it generated on the open list. So this is how depth first search does it. Okay, so this is actually a really cool teaching um, visualization aid is that depth first search when it reaches a dead end is going to go to the most recently generated yellow spot on the map. Okay, now if I do breadth first search, what it will do is it the reason this looks laggy or slower is because if I pause this and go to single step, what's happening is that it is current, it alternates back and forth, right? It's going breadth first. So it's moving out in all directions, one at a time, versus depth first search that goes all the way deep until it gets stuck and then it can't go any further. So now it goes down here, can't go any further, it goes down here. See how that works? That's so cool. I, I really like that. And I should have probably done this in the lecture, right? Rather than in the non-mandatory GUI explanation. But nobody is perfect. So, all right. Uh, where does the action listener take place? I'll get to that. How do humans do it? Well, humans just look at it. Like if I were trying to solve this map, right? If I, if I reloaded this, then I would just start looking, right? If I want to get from here to here, I would just try and then do the backtracking myself. Maybe put little markers here. Like, I don't, I don't know. Every human does that differently. Okay. So what I then do is there are a bunch of functions that I need to call to set up the GUI. So I call those in the constructor. So I set the HTML, I add the event listeners, I set the drawing method, blah, blah, blah. So if I go down here to the set HTML function, so if you look at the HTML and you say, where are all the form elements? There's nothing in this HTML file, right? There's nothing there. Like if you look, this is the entire contents of the HTML file. Well, what, actually, what I actually do is in the JavaScript, I, I actually construct and place all of the elements. So in, in HTML and JavaScript, you can actually construct the, the HTML elements in JavaScript and then put them exactly where you want into the HTML. 
So some would call this overkill, but it gives me a lot of um, a lot of control over things. So that's how I do that. And then in the GUI are the hard coded test cases for the actual tests. Okay. So here are the start tiles and the goal tiles. And then here's the function that actually runs and times all of those tests and then puts it into the GUI itself. So that's how that works. And then let's go to the draw function. So here's what happens every single frame inside the user interface. So first, I'm going to time the drawing. Uh, and this isn't actually shown. This is just from my own debugging. So I start a timer. Then I, um, I clear the foreground to white. So what I actually do is I only draw the background once to the background canvas at the beginning of like the constructor of the object. Okay. So when I start, that's when the background is drawn. Not, uh, I don't need to ever redraw that. So every frame I clear the foreground so that it's, it's clear. Um, then what I do is I say, if the left mouse button is held down and it's a valid location, then I have all of this logic. Okay. So this is sort of, um, this dot O M X in my event handler. What I do is I parse the mouse's location, figure out what tile it's on and store that as a variable. So this dot O M X stands for this dot original mouse X. So that's O M X is where I clicked the mouse. That's the tile of the map that I clicked the mouse. Now I have some code here. One is if I want to show iterations. So show iterations is the uh, animated search. So if that option is selected and I haven't finished yet, then what I want to do, I have an animation speed variable. So the animation speed, if I want to go, the normal speed will draw one step of the animation every 60 or every 60th of a second. What the different speeds do, for example, um, animated search, you see speeds here. So what two times speed does is that every 60th of a, se of a second, it will draw two steps of the animation. At 4x speed, every 60th of a second, it will draw four steps of the animation, okay? Similarly, um, if I have it set to half speed, then every 60th of a second, every second iteration will be skipped. And so it won't do that. So that's how those speeds work. Uh, otherwise, if I'm not showing the iterations, then what happens is um, this is where the while loop of the algorithm happens, right? So remember how I said that your search student, your search iteration function is what should be inside the while loop of the algorithm in the, in the lecture slides. This is why if you have a while loop, like if you take the BFS algorithm, it has a while loop in it. If you have that while loop in this code, it's wrong, right? And it won't animate properly. So if your code, the animate search should work for your code. If it doesn't, if you click animate search and on the second iteration, the path is complete, then it's incorrect. You have not done this correctly because here's the while loop. It says, while the search is in progress, do this stuff, okay? So that's, if I'm not showing the animations, then I just wanna show the path instantly. So what I do is I start a timer, I, I call your search um, until it's done, and then I stop the timer, and then I compute it that way. Next, what happens is I draw the open list, okay? So I draw the open list nodes in yellow, then I draw the closed list nodes in red. So you can, I have a draw agent function. So draw agent just draws the square onto the screen. So I take the closed li list and the open list X and Y positions. I draw them with the given size and the size for this assignment is always going, this is object size. It's always going to be one for assignment one. And the open list I draw with an orangey color and the red I draw or the closed list I draw with a red color. Um, I got a question. What's the main point of this AI application? So that's obviously someone, this is the assignment for, um, for my AI course. And this, this assignment is all about teaching you how to, uh, write search algorithms. 
So I won't go into it in any more detail because I don't have to. Um, now I draw the agent in yellow so that the agent is where the, the person, the, the mouse is actually at. Um, this is where I draw, sorry, this is where I draw the mouse and I draw it in white. If a search is in progress, then I draw the goal, okay? So that's the drawing of the goal location. And then I say this dot draw grid, and I can, I can get to that. Then I draw the text out of, of some different things. And oops, this is not for assignment two. <laughs> this is only for assignment two, but I left it in here, it's just legacy code. Draw agent. Um, if you want to draw something in HTML and Canvas, then you just fill a rectangle. It's really, really simple code. Um, here, if I draw the grid, so drawing the grid is if I toggle the grid, right? This is without the grid, this is with the grid, right? So that's the toggling of the grid. So I just draw some lines for the grid. Um, that's pretty much it other than the event listeners. So I have event listeners that are added to the foreground canvas. So I'm not going to get into exactly how this ha happens, but if you, I call this dot foreground canvas dot add event listener, the name of that event listener is mouse move. And then what happens is whenever the mouse moves, this function gets called. So, um, I have a get mouse position function, which takes in some, some parameters. So it figures out the mouse position and then it sets things like, okay, if this is a valid position, then this is where I should start the search, right? Now, uh, whenever the mouse is clicked, so this is mouse down, um, this function gets called. Whenever mouse up gets called, um, that's, that, this gets called as well, okay? And here, uh, this little line of code, if you notice, so when I'm in a website, I can right click and get this menu. But if you right click over here, this is a hidden function of the assignment. Um, oh, sorry, this is the search. In assignment two, what we will be doing is, and this is actually a hint toward one of the optimizations. If I right click, it's going to say, it's going to draw in purple all of the tiles that are connected, and we'll talk about connectedness in a, in a couple of lectures, that are connected to this tile. So of course, connected means there's a path that's, that's possible between them. So if I right click here, it knows that all of these um, spaces are connected. Right? It knows these greens are connected, but they're not connected to these greens. So this is why my assignment doesn't um, do any processing if I try and uh, run a path from here to here, for example. And it's because we pre-compute connectivity and we actually do checks for that, okay? Um, so that's pretty much the user interface. It's got some other things. So for example, each um, menu item here has its own function. So whenever I click here to set something, a function is called. And so that is, um, the, all these are just like setting the map and getting the algorithm stuff from those. So that is basically it. Um, the rest of it, you can have a look at it. Um, all right. So I had another question. Why can't we draw the grid every time a new code is created instead of being time dependent? I'm not sure, um, Medi Solo in the chat, I'm not sure what you mean by that, so I'm not sure how to answer that. If you could uh, rephrase that. We can, uh, we try that if we have enough time. So yeah, someone asked if they can try that. You can, but like, I don't necessarily recommend it. Uh, I, I love when people do extra stuff, but just to let you know, if, you, if you're trying that, we will learn exactly how to do that for assignment two. So if you're, if you're frustrated with it and you can't get it, don't worry, we're going to be learning that for assignment two. I'm gonna go check the Discord. No questions in Discord, that's good. The kitten is still asleep and so I won't bother her right now. Uh, but that's really all I wanted to cover today and it's, it's almost perfect timing. So if there's no other questions, um, that's where we're gonna leave it for this lecture. Um, so yeah, just as a reminder, we're gonna go back here. So this assignment is due on the 29th at 11.59 p.m. Uh, the D2L Dropbox is not there yet, that will be created soon. And please remember that when you submit this, 
Uh, there are instructions here in the search student. All of your assignment one code should be in this file. It is the only file submitted. Okay, so I'm going to I'm going to post this on D2L just so everyone knows who didn't watch this lecture. But this is important just to beat it home to you how important semantics are for computer science and how important it is to meet the specification of your customer because I'm I'm the customer. Um, you have to submit only this file for your assignment. If you don't, you will lose 10%. Okay? And that seems harsh, but it's not at all harsh because all you have to do is only submit this file. Every single year I, I go through this speech and every single year there are two or three groups who end up losing 10%. Um, now, 10% of this assignment isn't the end of the, the world because it's only it's not worth that much. Um, but please do not zip this file. Do not send all of the files. Do not send the HTML file. Do not send the .mac OSX file. Only submit searchstudent.js. Okay, that's very important. Uh, oh, another question. We're fine with searching one by one for now. Yes, that is in fact the only option that you have. You cannot edit this option in the GUI here, okay? So assignment one is only uh, one by one object size. All right, so that's gonna do it for today. Um, remember, assignment is due in a week at 11.59 p.m. And anytime um, you have questions, feel free to email me between now and the assignment due date. But if you're contacting me the day the assignment is due, and you haven't started anything, that's when I start to have very little sympathy for you. So please, if you have questions, ask me now, because questions on the day that the assignment is due is, um, is not cool. All right, uh, one last question. Where do me the, submit the assignment? I don't see a D2L Dropbox, so I just said that I'm going to be putting that up probably today. Okay, so there will be a Dropbox on D2L, and that's where, you're, where you will be submitting all of your assignments. Cool. All right. Um, that's it. See you on Thursday.